Good evening. If you've read the title to this video and you're hoping for something salacious and uh, exciting to follow, you, you, you're probably going to be very disappointed because my connection with the, with the sex trade is not really that great. But uh, there is a connection between the, the cab trade and the sex trade which I think deserves to be talked about. Uh, in the in the 50s and 60s, before I was a cab driver, uh, there were there was a, a lot more street prostitution. Uh, the Street Offences Act put a stop to it almost overnight. Not quite overnight. Went on for a while longer, but it it, it drove all those street prostitutes indoors drove them into massage parlours and brothels and uh, telephone liaisons and all kinds of other things, probably online these days. But uh, in, in those times, uh, street prostitution was a common thing. And uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about Bayswater, which was a large and probably the most important red light district in London uh, at that time and it, it it's situated between uh, Paddington Station, Mayfair of course where a lot of rich people are, live and, uh, and work and Hyde Park which is a, a big open space and in uh, in those days, I'm talking about the 60s, uh, there was a, a ten, there were a number of prostitutes who used to work up and down Bayswater Road uh, near to the gates to the park, and their object was to find a customer and to get a cab and do their whatever they did in the back of the cab as we as the cab took them on a, a drive round the park the park's about a mile round i guess and it really doesn't take very long so quite often they would come back to somewhere like marble arch or Hyde park corner where they started and uh the girl the girl would or the woman would would say uh, oh once more round the park please driver and they set off and go around the park, and of course, in in recognition of that trade, as it was a regular thing, and there were several several women working uh, that point at any time, there was a kind of unofficial taxi rank. So the taxi drivers they knew what was going to happen, and they ranked up and took people in order. Uh, as they came up, they were, you know, the girls put their hand up and they drove forward and the rain came. Um, in those days, uh, and indeed when I started cabbing, uh, the sight lines of a cab were such that it was really quite difficult to turn around and look at your customers. It was very cramped. And anyway, in that situation, you wouldn't really want to do that. Uh, and you couldn't really see from the rear view mirror below about mid chest, about here. Uh, so what was going on below that was anybody's guess. And uh, of course, uh, uh, a taxi was quite a large vehicle in those days, especially the trend for four by fours and people carriers hadn't taken place. And, Taxi was one of the largest vehicles on the road, so there weren't any weren't many people who would look be able to look down and see what was happening. So back of a cab was a fairly private place, <coughs> and whatever whatever went on in the back, I can only imagine. But uh, of course, Bayswater was was a, a, a red light district, and uh, what that means is that there. People, well, women prostitutes had uh, a red light outside their 
premises to show that they were a working red light establishment. And the rule was uh, in, in, in those days that a, 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 um, in those days uh, Bayswater was is an area where the, the houses are large at one time were luxurious and are again still now but at that time there was there were a lot of them uh, were derelict and slumland sl owned by slum landlords and they were in a poor condition and the rule was that if you were a landlord you could rent out the top half of the building uh, divide it into uh, three or four flats apartments and rent them out to three or four families and you could have a, one prostitute in the basement uh, and it was a very common thing I mean I'm sure not every house was a, <laughs> had a prostitute in it but it, common enough and the police or the authorities turned a blind eye to that because if you had more than one uh, prostitute operating in the building you were keeping a house of ill repute and it was liable to prosecution if you just had one well, it was kind of like acceptable and so an awful lot of those basements were occupied by uh, prostitutes and what would typically happen if you'd be walking around in that area and you'd see a red light and if you went and knocked on that door you'd probably be let in by a maid who was probably an older woman somebody who was probably had been a prostitute and uh, no longer could do that but you'd be let in by that maid and it's shown into a waiting room and then sometime soon afterwards this book maid would come back for you and say madam will see you now and uh, you'd be led off to madam and madam would uh, well the aim of the exercise for all prostitutes the prostitutes and women are, who are in the sex trade they're not in it uh, well, they're in it for the money and their aim is to get the money off you and get you on your way as quickly as possible. They kind of lose patience with people who want to take their time. They just want to get your money and get you out of there. And, and who can blame them? And, and quite often they'd, they'd have a, a... In those places there'd be another room somewhere out of sight where there was a big burly man who was there to protect the woman working. Technically, he could be accused of living on immoral earnings and often it was the, the men who got prosecuted for doing that. But in actual fact, although some of them were, were controlling and uh, uh, using the women for vice, very often the men were just there for protection because if one of the customers suddenly got difficult and they often well it, it would happen I'm sure and uh, these big burly men would come in and sort it out and uh, anyway that was that was how the, the trade went on in in Bayswater of course uh, London's a big place and there are there are other uh, red light areas. There's uh, one similar to Paddington around uh, around King's Cross, Argyle Square. There are hotels, many hotels there. You used to be able, and probably still can, rent them by the hour. You can rent a room by the hour. And what you what what you can do in an hour, I, I suppose. Uh, it's up to you, but, but uh, they were typically uh, used by uh, prostitutes who would take their clients and rent a room for an hour. Uh, it's a it's a big railway station, and the other 
place of note uh, is Soho, which is the commercial centre of the sex trade in London, really. And, you know, there are strip clubs, clip joints, peep shows, some actual prostitution going on, people selling obscene literature and, uh, of all sorts and oh, it's it's got an atmosphere and it draws people who come to London, typically come to London for a, I don't know, an important cup tie or a football match or something and they come to London, have a few drinks in the evening and the next thing they want to go to the red light district and uh, thing a bit bit frisky let's say and they go to <laughs> they go to uh, to Soho but uh, let me tell you once upon a time it happened to me I was walking around I was walking around Soho getting some time actually I, I think I had to meet somebody uh, later on and I had some time to kill and I was walking around peering in the shop windows and yes generally walking around and uh, somebody a man came up to me and said are you looking for a woman and I said no no I'm just just wasting time and he said are you looking for a man and I I, I said, no, I'm really not looking for anyone. I'm, I'm just walking around killing some time. And I suppose that may have led to some kind of liaison. I, I might have been taken off to uh, visit a, a woman or um, even a man. Uh, but uh, I've got the feeling that the most likely outcome was that I'd be led down some dark, lonely place, beaten up and robbed. <laughs> I think that's quite a common outcome. And uh, anyway, well, I wasn't tempted, so it didn't happen. Um, the, once upon a time, the nearest I came to it, uh, I suppose, was... Once I picked up a, a, a couple of people at uh, Paddington, uh, no, sorry, Victoria Station, and they were a very odd couple, a kind of rather glamorous looking black woman who looked like, I don't know, something out of the Supremes, and uh, a, a man, a rather short, scruffy looking man in a, a, a an ill-fitting suit, shall we say. And, uh, you know, they were an odd couple. But he wanted me to take them to Penge, where he would drop her off and uh, come back to North London. So potentially it was a good job. Although I was a little bit worried that they were going to get a Penge and run off, or I was going to sort of... I didn't really... I wasn't really comfortable with the job until I got the money in my hand but then well he, he didn't seem like the sort of person who would put up much of a fight anyway uh, so I took them to Penge which is quite a long way south London and uh, as, soon, as soon as I set off from uh, Victoria Station the, the windows in the back steamed up, started steaming up. There was, I don't know what was going on in the back, because that, as I explained before, you, you didn't have a very good sight line. You could really see anything. You couldn't really see anything below about chest level, so I don't know what was going on in the back there, but my goodness, they did not generate a lot of heat. So, so eventually, and it went on all the way, all the way to Penge. Uh, so eventually I got to Penge and this woman got out and um, said goodbye and sure enough he set off back to North London, somewhere like Harrow Road or somewhere like that. And I took him back and uh, yeah, we didn't 
talk. I, I didn't really want to ask what was, what it was all about. But I got him home and uh, he paid me, and uh, it was good. It turned out to be a, a good job, but a little bit stressful, shall we say? Yeah, there is a there is a remnant of that street trade left, and. Uh, particularly around King's Cross, at the back of King's Cross. And these days, of course, nobody gets in a cab and uh, everybody's got a car or a van of their own. And the girls that operate that trade are, by and large, uh, young women who are probably too young or too drug addicted to uh, be working indoors in a massage parlour or, or a... Uh, any kind of organised setup, and I, yeah, I, they, it, it's it's pitiful, really. It, it's sad. You you see these girls, what they call dipping and peering, which is you know looking going the dip. And they look into a car window to see if somebody's interested in them. They're looking for customers in cars, which they take off to some corner around there and uh, operate their business but um, I, I think probably that a lot of that money that they earn is either going straight into somebody else's pocket or is being wasted on crack or heroin or some such thing and yeah sorry it's pitiful <laughs> oh yes there is another way in which um, we were involved in the sex trade and that is that uh, with, at, at night there are there are clubs and as I explained before the Street Offences Act brought a lot of prostitution off the street and into the building and one of the buildings it was brought into was the strip club but well, sorry the the clip joint as opposed to a strip club, it's a, it, it's a it's a nightclub where people go and uh, they I don't know men go actually and they sit on the table and there are hostesses uh, who come and join them on the table and talk them probably talk them into buying a bottle or two of champagne usually cheap but very expensive champagne if you know what I mean and uh, the uh, their object is to earn as much money for the club as possible and but the, those clubs used to pay a commission to taxi drivers who brought people to them and uh, very often um, well, not very often, but occasionally, men would get into a cab and say, oh, oh, can you take me to a club where I can, you know, uh, meet a woman, you know. And, um, well, you, you, there were several. There was, uh, there was the cabaret uh, in Bond Street. It was Churchill's, which is further down Bond Street, I think. And there was one in Tottenham Court Road. There were several others. This was before lap dancing clubs, so they, they hadn't invented lap dancing yet, so they were just hostess clubs. And very often the guy would uh, go in and you'd say, well, go and see if you like it, see if it's all right for you, and he'd, he'd go in. And if he, as soon as he paid his entry fee, the doorman, doorman from the club would come out give the cab driver the entrance fee. That would be the commission. And then they'd be in there and then the girls would work their, uh, work their magic and persuade them to buy some more and more drink, which the girls probably didn't really drink themselves, but the idea was to get as much money out of these guys as possible. Um, some of the girls, many of the girls actually, um, went case which what it mean what it it meant was that actually they would 
They would negotiate with these customers that after their evening's entertainment, when they had bought a sufficient quantity of expensive champagne, they would go off with them to their hotel room or wherever they were, wherever they were going, and spend some time with them. And it was called Going Case. And uh, some girls did that, some girls didn't. Some just wanted to be hostesses, some didn't. It was a bit, a bit reminiscent of the, the so-called uh, Playboy Bunny Club, uh, which was very early on uh, for me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was very chaste in a way. Your customers weren't allowed to touch the girls but actually if you slip the doorman a few pounds you could make contact with some of the girls who did want to uh, make a little extra money on the side and well that's <laughs> like doorman everywhere but apart from the very top hotels they're all out to make a few quid on the side and that's one of the things they did, introduce people to clients. And, and to give you an example of, of the sort of, I mean, the sort of people who did go to these clip drawings, I mean, I, I was asked once in the middle of the day, four burly, well-dressed German guys got in the cab and they'd obviously been to some sort of business meeting or something, and they said, oh, oh, do you know where we can buy some women? You know, in the middle of the day, I I had to rack my brains to think where I could take them, but, yeah, you know, I don't know, that, that kind of, um, uh, what can you call it? It's kind of, it did, man's depravity seems to know no bounds. <laughs> 